to have the Rancho Divines today. And uh, they will be doing uh, different parts of the service. They start with the prelude. Uh, so um, what about a round of applause? Let's give them a round of applause before we just get them inspired for the rest. And, and I promise more will come, as you say. So uh, we, will, uh, we will begin our worship together. Precious God, we thank you. Thank you for gathering us today, here and now. As we gather this morning in your name, we come to you with hearts filled with so much love and grace. Now we start this worship, so we invite your Holy Spirit to descend upon us, remaining every corner of our hearts. Fill this place with your grace and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Would you please stand if you're able? And remain standing after the call to worship for the opening. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless God's name. 
Proclaim God's salvation from today to day. Our opening hymn is number 351, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. So it's a joy to be able to welcome the Rancho Divines with us again. Uh, they'll be doing all the special music parts and uh, just looking very much uh, forward to it. Uh, a lot of these are show tunes that have uh, sneaky Christian messages uh, or at least religious messages like sunrise, sunset. Uh, and uh, so we, uh, uh, we will very much appreciate their music today. Uh, for um, uh, for our uh, this week, uh, we have an outreach meeting at five o'clock on Tuesday, uh, so that's in room fourteen, uh, and then prayers and squares at the Dugan home, and then also a finance meeting at um, uh, at um, uh, in room at, at, on Wednesday uh, at six o'clock. And Kim's got her hand up, so. Probably more information about prayers and squares. That's right. Just a little bit of adjustment. It's going to be 9 to 3. So it's our day to bring something to share for lunch. And it'll be too hot to eat on the patio. So we'll be in the house. But yesterday we had a youth um, swim party. And we were outside all day. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful day. And our kids are thriving thanks to Hannah. So Hannah, thank you so much for being such a wonderful leader for our youth. It was wonderful. So yeah, there is a swimming pool. So if it gets too hot, you guys can all just sit in the pool. So uh, uh, probably not. Yeah. Uh, do we have other announcements that need to be made for today? Yes. Or 
We're going to need to have a work party uh, here at church next Saturday, so anybody who is willing and able, uh, we need your help. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I damaged my thumb trying to put up lights. So uh, we have more light now, a little bit more. So we'll see, uh, we'll see if it helps our, uh, our video a little bit. Uh, but um, uh, we, need a, we need a work party to do some work. Uh, and then also, uh, let me make an introduction for Hannah. She, uh, her wedding is on September 30th. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sign-up sheet in the Narthex uh, to make sure that they have enough you know, seats and food and stuff. Uh, so if you are planning on going to that, be sure you sign up uh, in the Narthex. It's going to be a big, big, fun thing. Uh, it's going to be at Claremont School of Theology uh, because uh, that's where the, both she and Kevin uh, have done schoolwork, have done their schoolwork, and uh, we still have it until December. <laughs> so uh, they wanted to be able to use the chapel there at Claremont. Uh, so that's uh, that's their plan. September 30th, sign up in the Narthex if uh, if you uh, are able and want to come. Is that right, Hannah? Yeah. Okay, very good. Good. All right. So we come to joys and concerns, uh, and we'll um, uh, we'll let people go ahead and uh, and give joys and concerns first, and I'll fill in if there's anything missing. Wait, yes, Bonnie. Just prayers. Yes. Uh, uh, Bonnie is re reminding us to pray for the people in Hawaii. Yes. Uh, how very, very tragic. Um, over a hundred dead now. And uh, we lost the Lahaina Church, which I've worshipped at several different times. And uh, what, a, what a terrible loss, but you know, buildings can be replaced and lives can not. And so we lift those families that have lost loved ones. Okay, other choice concerns? Matt's birthday! <laughs> it is Matt's birthday. Do you want to, did you do, want to say something about that? Oh, we got to sing happy birthday. So you got to sing, oh, he's now 18, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. we got to have Matt come down here. Matt, come on down. <laughs> He looks so good. Speaking, it was 
she seemed to be asleep all the time. Uh, there was no evidence of reaction that she was really here hurt us, but uh, the heart music does tend to to give her a sense of peace and relaxation, and uh, we hope that she felt the love that we all feel for her as, uh, as we were with her. Thank you. Oh, I sh yes, I should have mentioned she's back at the gardens, uh, not in the hospital, and in their health center there in case uh, you want to visit her. All right, I guess uh, for those of you who don't know the history, uh, she uh, did have a stroke. Uh, right after the stroke, we were able to communicate with her, uh, but now she is on uh, a lot of morphine to, uh, to keep her comfortable. Uh, she's on hospice, and, um, and so that's why she's not waking up at all. But you never know what, what they're hearing when, when uh, that is the case. So uh, we continue to pray for her. Thanks, Dan. Yes. Oh, was there someone back there? No. Any other Joyce concerns? Joyce Clifton. Joyce Clifton is now back at. Yeah. It's in the email. It's in Joyce's email. Oh, in Joyce's email. Joyce Clifton is. I think it's Loma Linda. Is it Loma Linda? Yeah, she's in Loma Linda. To be closer to her son, if I remember. Okay, so Joyce Clifton is uh, uh, in Loma Linda. Is there an update on Sean? On Sean? Yeah, the COVID. Was it COVID? Oh, I think he didn't, he's, he's clean. He didn't catch COVID, yeah. No, yeah, for, you know, praise the Lord. Yeah, with, with everything that happens, he and Ramona are, uh, are safe. Good. All right. Let's, uh, I don't see any other Joyce concerns. Let's all stand up. Oh, 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 and the flowers. That's right, we didn't get the flowers uh, 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 dedicated. It comes from the uh, Mar Marinda family uh, in celebration of their mothers. So uh, thank you so much for, for giving us flowers again. Thank you. All right, now let's greet each other with words of peace. <laughs>
Uh, and we're only going to sing the first verse of this one. Uh, the morning is broken, it's a little bit long. All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead.
Thank you. We'll get that. We'll get that down uh, better with a little time. Uh, that's the choir version, and it's Julie's favorite. And so we had to play it that way. So uh, thank you. Everyone. Oh, the kids! <laughs> yes! Good, good, good. Come on up, Lisa, and, and kids. Joseph Rome. Any of you guys remember John Antu? The youth group tied dyed this for him. So I went digging it out. And I was asking Pastor Ben, I'm like, you want to wear it? You can wear it. And we totally fit him because we all know how big John was. Nice, large, tongued guy. So I had to wear it because we're talking about Joseph today. And Joseph had the beautiful coat that his father gave him because he was his favorite. He had 12 sons, 12 kids. And Joseph was his favorite. Do you think you have a fa your parents have a favorite? <laughs> ah, I don't know. Do you guys think I have a favorite? Who do you think my favorite is? Yes. <laughs> Matt. Who's my favorite? You or your sister? I don't have one. Good answer. Good answer. But yes, he kind of gets a little bit more spoiled now because he's all on his own. But yeah, before he was born, yeah, she was my favorite because it was the only one I had. Uh, there's a 10-year gap between my two kids. So yeah, kind of my favorite. So Roman, you're nodding your head. Who do you think you're, you're who, are you the favorite or is Alpha? <laughs> Alpha's a favorite? <laughs> Figures. Should, you know, do we really have favorites? I don't know. Some of you have more kids than the two I have. I'm like, do you really have favorites? Nah, not really, right? You try not to. There's certain things you like about certain kids, right? There's certain things that certain kids do that are better than others. And you kind of like them that way, right? But favorite. Is Alpha the favorite? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. All right. So you guys started school this week. So I'm sure you have a higher low, right? You don't have a low, even? Well, that's good, because this week wasn't all high, right? It was all high, because first, first week of school, do you like your classes? Yeah. Roman had to move all over the place, because now he's in junior high. How was that? Did you get lost? <gasps> Priorities, not getting lost. There you go. Wait till high school. A lot bigger. A lot bigger. And you? You found your class, all good. Everything's fabulous. And Charlotte starts tomorrow. Yay. Do you know who your teacher is yet? Yes. All right. Well, that's good. Do we like the teacher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard to say, right? Your favorite grade, Renee? Third grade. Yeah. Fourth. Uh, third graders. Third graders. I like third grade. Chris and I were just saying that we both remember our third grade teacher's name, and I'm like, yeah, mine was one of my favorites. I loved my third grade teacher. She was fabulous. But then there was my fifth and sixth grade teacher who was phenomenal. Um, we had to do plays. It was fun. Anyway. All right. So we're going to go talk about Joseph. Sorry, Roman. You have your clipboard to hang out. Charlotte, you can join us. All right. Dear Lord, thank you for these wonderful children. Thank you for their wisdom, their funniness, their silliness, their kindness, and their love. Let them spread that love to others in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing with me if you'd like, but be in the spirit of prayer. Oh Lord. 
With your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling have spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side, I will seek other seas. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that we have received. We thank you for our families. We thank you for the joy shared uh, with friends and, and loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you will inspire us anew, that you will surround us with your presence, that we would know your presence and rely upon your grace. Lord, we lift up those in, in serious need, uh, the tragedy in Hawaii, Lord, uh, we pray that you would surround all those who suffered such great loss. Uh, Lord, as uh, Kay uh, continues uh, in these last uh, days of her life, maybe in last weeks, Lord, we pray that you would comfort her, that you would draw her close. Uh, we know, Lord, that, uh, that she is surrounded in your presence. Uh, we lift up uh, Joyce, as, as she moves and continues to heal, we pray that uh, you, would, you would make her strong again and uh, that she would be able to be up and, and doing all the things that she loves. Lord, uh, we uh, lift up others that we hold in our hearts but maybe have not named. We lift them in silence before you this day. <sighs> And Lord, we give you thanks for such joys. We thank you for uh, the choir that is uh, sharing their gift of music with us. Lord, we thank you for Matt and uh, his, his birthday. Uh, but more than that, his advancement uh, in life into, uh, into college and, and beyond. Lord, we pray that you would be with him and with all of our uh, college uh, college members. Uh, and uh, Lord, we, we ask uh, that we would be open to your presence, that we would be aware of your direction, your guiding, and that we might always have the courage to follow. In the name of our precious Savior, we pray the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship this morning as we dedicate our tithes and offerings to God.
Gracious God, we gather here today to acknowledge your abundant blessings and to remember the faith and obedience shown by Jacob and the disciples. As we prepare to offer our gifts, we seek to align our hearts with your purpose. As we present our offerings, may they be a symbol of our faith our trust in your provision, and our desire to be obedient to your will. Bless these gifts, multiply them, and use them to spread your love. May we, like Jacob and Peter, find our identity in you and become a testament to your love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, our special choir, Rancho Divines, will lead us for this song, Back to Be Born.
morning is from Genesis 37, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 28. Jacob, excuse me, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Bilal and, the, and of Zilpah, and his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Continuing on, on verse 12. Now his, father's, his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Sechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Sechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to them, Go and see if all is well with your brothers, with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Sechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they found him in the distance, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come on now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we shall see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brother, what shall, will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. And from Matthew, we have chapter 14, verses 22 to 23. Excuse me. I thought I was prepared, but I wasn't. I was in the wrong place. So give me a moment, please. I think I'm right. Jesus walks on the water. Thank you. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a, consist a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, watching on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. 
But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. So one day, Jesus and Moses were out golfing. I guess maybe the golf courses are great in heaven, I, I don't know. Now this was a regular golf course, and uh, uh, Jesus uh, came up to the tee, one of the holes. Uh, there was a big water trap there in front, a water hazard. Uh, and uh, so he uh, pulled out his, um, his, his seven iron uh, and got ready to hit it over the, um, uh, over the water. And Moses said, oh, you'll never do that with a seven iron. That's, that's much too far. You might even use a, a wood or something to get over it. He goes, no, no. Arnold Palmer told me to use a seven iron. And so he got that ball and he hit it and splashed right in the water. And Moses said, okay, I'll take care of it this time, but not again. He raised his staff, the water parted. Moses went out, got Jesus' ball and brought it back. So if you're smiling, you know the story. Uh, and uh, Jesus again picked up his seven iron, and Moses said, no, no, you can't, you can't use that one. And he said, Arnold Palmer said to use the seven iron. And he, he got ready and splashed into the water again. Moses said, okay, this is the last time. He raised his staff, went out, got the ball, brought it back to Jesus. And Jesus kept the seven iron in his hand. And Moses said, you couldn't do it before. You won't be able to do it now. And he said, Arnold Palmer said to use the seven iron. Splash in the water again. And Moses said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to help you. It's, it's, all, it's all done. And so Jesus got out and walked on the water. That today's passage. Walked on the water and looked down to get his ball. And the next group of golfers came along and they said, who does that guy think he is, Jesus Christ? And of course, Moses said, no, he is Jesus. He thinks he's Arnold Palmer. <laughs> uh, uh, the other story about walking on the water that I was thinking of is, is the Incredibles uh, kids movie. Um, and uh, uh, in it, uh, the little boy is named Dash, uh, and he runs really, really fast. That's his, his superpower. It's a superpower type of thing. Uh, and, and, but it isn't until he's chased by the bad guys that he realizes that he can run so fast he can run across the surface of the water. So he can run across water to get away from the bad guys. Uh, so that's his, that's his um, I guess you'd call it a gift, right? Uh, a spiritual gift. Uh, Joseph, of course, had a spiritual gift. His was the gift of dreams and the interpretation of dreams uh, that could tell, among other things, tell the future. Uh, so that was, that was his gift. Uh, let us be in prayer. Gracious God, open our eyes to see you around us. Help us know what you would have us do. Give us the strength, Lord, and the courage to truly use all the gifts that you give us, that we might be a better witness to you. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Joseph had this gift of dreams and the interpreting of them. He and young Benjamin were the only children of Jacob's second wife, Rachel. And so they were Jacob's favorites because she was his favorite wife. He bought Joseph a special cloak, and here the Hebrew is not really clear. Maybe it was many colored. Maybe it had long sleeves, as outer garments were often a poncho style. Maybe it was made of fine fabric with, with tassels on it, perhaps. 
In any case, his older brothers understand Joseph is dad's favorite. And his gift of dreams doesn't help the situation at all. He dreams that he is going to be a ruler, and his brothers are going to bow down to him, and he tells them about his dreams, so their anger burns hot against him. And they look for an opportunity to silence him. When uh, the kids were little, uh, they didn't talk to me about this, but they talked to Teresa. And they said, we know Rebecca, that was the oldest, that was my oldest daughter. We know Rebecca is dad's favorite, but who is your favorite? So here's the three little kids putting, putting Teresa on the spot. Who is your favorite? And she said, none of you. I don't even like you guys. <laughs> and they said, Mom, that's not true. <laughs> so, uh, and, and later on when I heard the story, I told them that I loved them all the same. So, and it's true. I did. Over the past month, we've been seeing stories about our father Jacob. He's one in a line of patriarchs, Abraham and Sarah's grandson the father of 12, including one, Joseph. When we look at the characters in the Bible, we have the opportunity to see ourselves more clearly. Jacob is a trickster and a con man, and as often happens, he becomes the victim of other people's cons. So he thinks he has it together, even as he sort of stumbles through life. This, our father Jacob. Dishonest, and so a victim of dishonesty. Perhaps he doesn't know of his older son's anger, even though it should be obvious, as he has heard the dreams. Perhaps he feels like he has a firm grasp on the situation. In any case, he sends Joseph to distant Shechem to check up on his brothers who are watching over flocks in the wilderness, not suspecting that Joseph is in danger. When we moved to Rialto, uh, the neighbors uh, took me aside and told me to watch out for any unusual looking plants in my backyard. Well, I thought that was interesting and said, you know, what do you mean? They said that when they moved in, their kids kept having strange skin problems. And it wasn't until a doctor really looked into it that they discovered that they were all different kinds of poisonous plants. They had uh, somebody from the agriculture or the county come out and check. And they were full of these exotic jungle dangerous plants. The person who had owned the house before had something for poisonous plants and had planted them all through the garden. And so they said, if you see any unusual plant growing in your backyard, be very, very careful. Jacob uh, feels like everything is just fine, and in fact he has poisonous things happening all around through the family. And he doesn't even see it, and sends Joseph off to check on his brothers. He's already been a tattletale. Perhaps he also wants him to sort of spy on his brothers as well. And you know that trouble is coming. They saw him coming along off, it says. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that while a wild beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dream. Reuben and Judah convince the others to sell Joseph into slavery instead of kill him. It isn't until Joseph is in the pit that he starts to become the man God intends him to be. In our Gospel reading, Jesus has just had the feeding of the 5,000. His Bible says immediately he makes the disciples get into a boat to row across the Sea of Galilee. It seems odd to us, but in John's Gospel, this is made more clear. The crowds are anxious to start a revolution to make Jesus king, and the disciples might join in 
and there would be a real problem for them and for the future of, of uh, the Jesus movement. Jesus sends the disciples out across the sea and then turns to dismiss the crowd and then take time for prayer after this momentous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. As is still the case on the Sea of Galilee, the wind comes up in the evening as the cool air tumbles off the mountains around the Sea of Galilee and the waters become dangerously rough. You might not know this, but Mark Twain actually went to the Holy Land. So Mark Twain went to the Holy Land and got into a boat out onto the Sea of Galilee and the waters were terribly rough. And do you know what, uh, Mark, you know what Mark Twain said as he was in that rough Sea of Galilee? He said, now I know why Jesus walked <laughs> on the water. The boat was dangerously close to sinking in the waves when Jesus caught up to them walking on the water. Now they were really terrified because they thought it was a ghost. Jesus said, take heart, have no fear, it is I. Then, as usual, Peter responds, and as usual, it's something both courageous and impulsive. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. If it were me, I would have said, that's great, Jesus, now get on the boat and take care of us. But Peter steps out onto the water. For Peter, tell me to get out and walk on the water with you. Jesus says, come, and Peter does it. But when he sees the winds and the waves, he becomes afraid and starts to sink. Lord, save me, he says. Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and saved him. When I was in seminary, we did a, a play, a musical called The Cotton Patch Gospels. Uh, it came out in 81, and that was when I was in seminary, so I, don't, I guess we must have bought the rights to it and, uh, uh, and, and did it there at the, at the seminary. Uh, it's a musical that was uh, to the music of, of Harry Chapman. Uh, he was one of the last things he did. Uh, but it took the, the, the books, uh, the book by uh, Clarence Jordan, uh, who's sort of a poet and scholar, uh, and, uh, and put it to music. Uh, in, this, uh, in this book, uh, it's, uh, it's written sort of Southern style, uh, modern Southern style, Cotton Patch Gospel. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fun. It's got a lot of, uh, a lot of fun things. Uh, and in it, uh, you know, Peter, you know, Peter is uh, from the Latin Petra, uh, which is the Latin translation of, of the Greek Cephas. Uh, and uh, those are all words for rock. And so, uh, and so Clarence Jordan said that, uh, uh, said that, that Jesus uh, named him Peter because he sank like a rock. So that's part of the play, you know, you say it like a rock, because he was Peter. Uh, actually, he's the rock on which he founds the church, remember that, uh, that statement? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe the other disciples thought that was pretty funny when Peter began to sink, that he had been named the rock, and here he was sinking. Our Bible says that when Jesus saves him, he says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? But in fact, the word in Greek really isn't doubt. It's the word to waver. The only other time the word is used in Matthew is in the last chapter, chapter 28, the very end of the gospel, when Jesus appears to them on the mountain after he's raised from the dead and tells them to go out to all the world and share the good news of God's love and new life. We call it the Great Commission. There it says, they worshipped him. This is the disciples. They worshipped him, but some wavered. Now again, our Bible is going to use the word doubt. And doubt would be confusing. Wavering makes a lot more sense. Because he's telling them to not go back to their fishing, not go back to their carpentry, not go back to whatever they were doing. Instead, 
go to all the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And they wavered. It makes perfect sense. We know that story because too often we waver. In today's uh, 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 um, scripture, it says, Jesus looked at Peter, and he looked at him straight in the face. This isn't the plural, this is the singular. This is the disciple who had just had the courage to step out of the boats and take uh, the boat and then take some steps on the water. Jesus says to him, why did you waver? Why do we waver? That is the question. Uh, when Hannah uh, first was here last summer, I told her, oh, you've got to go to In-N-Out. In-N-Out is the very best hamburger around. You know, and, 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 and uh, she was very polite. Of course, she, she's a college student. She already knew about In-N-Out. In-N-Out was her favorite stew, but she was just very politely said, yes, In-N-Out. And I'm telling her at length about how good In-N-Out hamburgers are. And then after we had broken, you know, after we were no longer with each other, I thought about that. I thought, why is it that we are so willing to, to with excitement, share the good news of In-N-Out? and not the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, why is it we waver? Why? You know, the Bible has these stories, and these stories aren't for us to laugh and make fun of disciples. It is where we can actually see ourselves. It is a clear mirror to our struggle. Why do we waver when we have something so precious as the fellowship that we have here? Knowing our Savior, Jesus Christ. Knowing the love of God and proclaiming a God so powerful that even death cannot stop the divine work that happens. Why do we waver when we have such a Lord? It is in the storm that Peter finds he can trust in Jesus. Peter steps on the water, risking his life, and his Lord is there to pull him out of the deep. Joseph, young Joseph, walks in pride, and only in his trials does he become a man of faith. It is the same for us. Life has trials that make us strong in our endurance. When we turn to the Lord in the storms, it is the way a true faith is built. As the gospel writer says, the gospel musician, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I would never know what faith in God could do. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. I've kept my faith through it all. I've learned to depend upon his word. When I was in Victorville, uh, I had a, a volunteer assistant pastor who was there and would do the first service, uh, which um, uh, was, was an early service. I attended it. Uh, he had been doing it when I got there. and. So then uh, we lost our, our pianist for that service, and so I had to do all of the old hymns on guitar. So not quite as good a lot of the time, but, uh, but singable nonetheless. Uh, his name was Gene, uh, and he was a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he had worked in uh, uh, the front lines uh, in, in places where airplanes were repaired, uh, hangars. Uh, but oftentimes uh, there was uh, where shelling would happen as well. Uh, and one, one day they had a particularly harsh amount of shelling. Artillery had been moved in uh, and uh, there were people dying all around him. Uh, and uh, he said that there was this terrible attack and, um, uh, and there was uh, a man uh, named Ethan that worked there. And Ethan was just an onerous person. He was, he was very selfish. 
He was very mean to everybody around him. Uh, he was uh, very prideful, and, uh, and, and he was one of the few that survived this. Uh, and uh, um, so uh, Gene wasn't sure how he would do, uh, went to see him uh, in the medical um, uh, place. Uh, and found that he had been hit with, with many pieces of shrapnel. And large pieces of shrapnel had been embedded into his chest and his heart was, was just missed in several different places. And uh, Ethan uh, uh, was very quiet when Gene was there to see him. And when he finally came out of the hospital, the scars on his chest had formed the image of a cross. And Ethan, where he could have been prideful and arrogant that he had survived and so many others hadn't, instead said that the sign of the cross was a sign for him that he needed to find out more about Jesus Christ. And when he got out of Vietnam, he went as a changed person to Nashville, to a seminary, and he became a preacher. In the midst of the trials of this tragedy, he found the hand of God and found faith. It is in our trials that real faith is born. And we must always remember to lean upon the hand of God so that we too can find the peace that only God can bring. In that name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn, Victory in Jesus, number 370. Let's stand as we say, 370. <laughs>
please be seated. Uh, the Rancho Divines is going to give us one last song. If you have to go somewhere, please do feel free to get up and leave if you need to. Uh, but they're going to give us one last song. And so instead of the benediction song, uh, we'll, let them, uh, we'll let them sing uh, a quick benediction. The Lord bless you. Thank you. 